as Sue Ellen says, I teach a freshman seminar. I have done this for five years on the many facets of humor. Facets is very important. All of you who listened this morning heard how humor wiggles into absolutely everything. Humor is the H-U-M in human. We are human. And I'm hoping that, that we can get back and forth with all this. Even though I'm an English teacher and I am accustomed to making the most fascinating things increasingly dull, um, I will try to give you as much theory quickly. And let's think about examples as I go along. Uh, Humor, there are a number of classic theories, and they have been massaged by various, the various philosophers over the years. But really, for the most part, if we look at them, there is the superiority one. The superiority one has many, many ways of looking at it. It's kind of the basis of irony. We are sitting here, and we know what, what the true in information is. And so we know better, and we are superior. Another part of the superiority theory is, well, if you slip and fall on the ice, it's funny. If I slip and fall on the ice, it's a tragedy. OK. Superiority is, is the kind of thing that, really, I never thought of Hobbes as a particularly jolly guy. But he did come up with an idea of humor, which was, Humor and laughter and all of this is the sudden glory when we recognize supremacy. Sort of nasty, but nevertheless, yes. And again, the basis of irony. Uh, there is the incongruity theory. And that means you're going to see something different. We are looking for the cognitive shift. When we have a joke, the punchline is not going to be what we expect. Look at all the images we saw today, things that we never expected. And with that, I, I must uh, admit that during the time I have taught this class, Sue Ellen has taken my class through the, uh, through the collection, the art collection, in the Elmhurst College Library, and has selected pieces and discussed the humor in them. It's absolutely wonderful at those to see the students' eyes open. Oh, my gosh, I never thought about that. I never thought about looking at something like that. Yeah, very important. And really, as far as serious art of any kind, I think that the humor is in there. The people who created it created it not with the idea of, I'm going to sit down here and I'm just going to grind out a great piece of art. No. You can tell there is something wonderful about what they see. Next step, of course, is the seeing. Uh, so many of you know, are, are artists, and you know that when you walk around and see things, they, you see more than the rest of us do. And then you convey that to us. Actually, this morning, when this shade was up, I would look out and see the L train go past. And I was thinking, yeah, that could, be, <laughs> that could be something. And they were always different every time. It's there. You're seeing. We are looking. And the other thing about us as human beings, there's so much to look at and so much to see because we're so beautifully imperfect. And that makes us funny. It makes us inconsistent, that's OK. Because nothing's perfect, and if we, could re if we can really understand that and accept it, it's amazing what it does for our outlook on life. Um, the incongruity really, like so many things, really hits ambiguity, logical impossibility, and think about the logical impossibilities that you looked at this morning. And there are other examples. For instance, uh, a physicist once told me that he always thought it would be amusing to have uh, a kind of a, a, an improv about the gentleman who had the idea of microwaves walking in 
to someone who might fund this and say, here, I have a wonderful idea. If we shoot these, these, these whatever they are through here, it will make all of the water molecules rub up against one another, and they'll get really hot, and we can cook stuff. Well, you can imagine. I'm going to give you money for that. That is the dumbest thing I ever heard. OK, how many times has that happened in, in the history of humanity? And there you go. Perhaps if that person had had a little bit of a sense of humor, he might have thought, well, sure, let's try this. Just let me see those molecules get friendly with one another. I don't know. But it, it might have helped. But the idea of things that are impossible, irrelevant, yeah. We think things are irrelevant right now. Maybe five years from now, that particular item might be extremely important. Yeah. And that happens in everything. Uh, and of course, there are things about inappropriateness. This morning, when you talked about, about how great art cannot necessarily be totally humorous, I started thinking about this cognitive shift thing. And actually, some people at lunch added a few more things. Uh, and actually, I thought hers was probably a little bit better. Uh, Artemisia with the head of Holofernes. <laughs> yes. I mean, when you look at that, talk about something that is really, we're looking at supposedly great art, and this woman is standing there smiling over a severed head. Yeah, let me entertain you. Uh, but it, it's not the kind of ho-ho funny, but it certainly is something to think about that this, and yet you look at it, it is a good, good piece of art. Um, there's also the matter of other kinds of inappropriateness, and you touched on some of that this morning, uh, the junior high type humor, all of that sort of thing. Okay, and even inappropriate humor has its place. Okay. Uh, Sigmund Freud, uh, actually, now here is another man. I think he's funny just because when I read it, I think <laughs> this can't be real. But nevertheless, <laughs> Sigmund Freud felt that laughter and humor had to do with a release of tension, whatever type of tension he was talking about. Well, it's true. Look at the aha moments we have. Look at the, the, um, the moments when we actually sit back and laugh. Yes, there is a terrific release there. In fact, many of you have felt as I had sometimes. It's been too long since I've sat down and really laughed. I mean, laughed so hard that the tears come and, and I'm shaking. I, I don't think I can do that for you this afternoon, but I wish I could because it's wonderful. OK, so the release of energy is another thing. And then finally, and this is quite relevant to what you talked about this morning, play theory. Yes, why can't we look at things from an attitude of play? I don't know. Why do they say we play music? And yet, you know, it's, practice, kid, practice. No, we're playing. We're playing. Uh, what do children do when you give them anything, anything to, to write with or draw with? They're not thinking, I'm going to work really hard and I'm going to draw the Taj Mahal. No, they just have a wonderful time. It's the best way to make little kids just enjoy. Uh, they'll, they'll keep quiet and play forever. The play theory and, uh, and approaching things with an attitude of play is very helpful. I have a story that I tell. Uh, I'm the director, actually, of the whole learning center at, at Elmhurst, and we, we work with mathemogenics, how people learn. And so if a student comes in with a particularly difficult problem of learning, we do what we can to help the student get around it. And a few years ago, a student came in who was taking four lab classes. She was getting ready for grad school, and she had somehow not taken enough. She had to take physics. And she had, she had, she had physics and three chemistry classes, or something insane like that. And so she said, I don't know what to do with this. It's so difficult. How am I going to make the time for it? And I looked at her and said, well, let's think about it. I said, uh, 
let's divide this up. Let's look at the things you really don't want to do, the things that are not so hard to do, and let's find something that's just a whole lot of fun. And so she looked at it, and she thought about it. She came back a week later, and she was really excited. She said, I decided that out of everything I have, I'm going to work very hard, but my physics class is going to be my fun class. OK. She did it. Not only did she, did she ace that class, but her instructor said, why in the world are you going to grad school in chemistry? With physics, you really get it. She approached it with the idea and the attitude of play. Now, with all of these things talking about humor, connecting them to art, I think I should be standing in front of the Chicago Public Schools and saying, triple your art education program, because it would do a lot for you. OK, as far as the history of humor, yes, you're right. Many people uh, have looked at humor as frivolous, silly, stupid, uh, not worth their time. But actually, uh, it's been around. The, uh, so often, humor and comedy is connected with fertility rights. Well, sure, it's fun. All right. Uh, the Greeks did a wonderful job with that. Now, Plato and Aristotle, even though they probably attended the comedies, uh, thought that uh, comedy was uncivilized and savage. But they accepted the pleasures anyway. So there. Uh, turns out Martin Luther, who never seemed like a real jolly guy to me, uh, he laughed on occasion. Uh, and when we got to Thomas Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas looked at, at the theology of the day and said, wait a minute, what are we doing here? Let's be joyful. It's all right to, to laugh. And of course, what happened after him? The Renaissance. Yeah, it worked just fine. This is, this is definitely microwave history, friends. Uh, yeah. Uh, and now, uh, we did have a few Puritan detours in which it wasn't really good to, to, to laugh and smile. But we'll set those people aside. And as we see what we saw this morning going from the latter part of the 19th century into the 20th and up to where we were this morning with, with the 60s and 70s, son of a gun, it has become much more, much more acceptable to laugh at things, to see humor in things, and we need it. We definitely need it. OK. And we need to remember also that powerful people don't like humor. Despots do not like people who are funny. And why? Because people who are funny can often turn a mirror on a despot and make him, you notice I say him all the time, very uncomfortable. All right. Um, so, uh, for instance, uh, let's see. Well, literature and drama, of course, began to laugh at the powerful, the arrogant, and the pompous. And what did we see with the delinquents this morning? Laughing at the powerful, the arrogant, and the pompous. They still do it. And now, in fact, uh, humor is even therapeutic. There is a society today called the Society for Therapeutic Humor. I think you should know about that. Uh, I can go on and on. There are a number of things that we can learn from comedy and, and, and humor that are worth thinking about. And those are the things that I'd like you to think about here. And this is actually, friends, my big finish so we can get on to the really fun stuff. Uh, the whole concept of wisdom is important. When I teach my students, I talk to them about critical thinking. And they really react to that after a while. They start looking at things, looking at things from different angles, different points of view, listening to people. Son of a gun. OK. From comedy and humor, we learn to be honest about strengths and weaknesses and to show a little bit of integrity in how we, how we act. It helps us to become a little more self-critical. And that's perfectly all right. We all know 
that it's good not to take ourselves too seriously. It helps us to think critically about institutions and authorities, especially for ones that want us to die for their cause or honor, something like that. Uh, Humor teaches us that we to be wary of uh, people who are trying to persuade us to think or act in a way that will benefit them. Think of the last time you, you caught one of those sales calls. You knew perfectly well what they had in mind. Now, sometimes you might have come up with a really clever, clever quip back to them. More often than not, you just hang up. But we are wary of that because we're thinking in different ways. Uh, facing problems, yeah. Avoid anger. Avoid hitting things straight on. Uh, avoid resentment and self-pity. Keep your cool and think. I didn't realize this until one of my students researched Lucille Ball. And what she came up with was how Lucille and her writers in I Love Lucy found ways to solve problems that were not the regular head-on, I am, I can fix everything sort of thing. Lucille always ran around the end. If you see an old one of them, watch it and see how she works it. And that was the genius of her comedy. Amazing there. Uh, always a different way, as with, as with images. There are so many ways to change that and, and, and to put something up there that juxtapose two things that will shock people or make them learn a lot more, figure things out. OK, uh, this helps us to keep mentally flexible then. And it helps us to remember that everybody has a story to tell, a perspective, and a contribution to make. That's what's so wonderful about walking through almost any collection of art. We're seeing times, places, different, different people, and what they are thinking. It's wonderful. OK. Uh, we know that violence should be a last resort. And harboring a gr grudge doesn't help anybody. And you'll notice people who bear grudges are not very funny, and they're not very fun to be around. OK. There is a lot to enjoy in living the life of a rational animal, which is what we are. Uh, we're basically rational. We may not be perfect, but we're OK. Uh, and remember that life is complicated and unpredictable. So with all of this, we need to re expect to be surprised and go with it. And that is one of the best things. I, Everything I look at <laughs> next door here, there is an enormous painting on the wall with a tiny, tiny uh, hummingbird up in the corner. This great big huge, I didn't have enough time. I was looking at it sideways. But nevertheless, the title of it is Think Big. And with that, I think I can just conclude and enjoy the rest of the afternoon, because this is going to be good.